Hello, everyone, and welcome back. As we approach the end of our series on factoring, um, we spent a lot of time looking at polynomials of different types and looking at how they factor. Um, we've looked at uh, factoring out GCFs, factoring by difference of squares, factoring by trinomial squares, factoring by guess and check. We've talked about um, factoring by grouping, and we looked at how we can solve equations that require us to factor uh, before solving. Today, we're going to talk about a couple different applications of factoring. We're going to do another video on that right after this, and that's basically going to take us to the end of our factoring unit. Now, factoring is one of several ways to solve polynomial equations, and um, here very shortly we'll get into some, some discussions of other methods of, fa uh, of, of solving those equations when factoring is not an option. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Let's talk about a few different applications of factoring. Um, this is a problem I grabbed from the Big Ideas Math book, Algebra 1. Um, they've got some great problems, so if you get a chance to check out their series, um, certainly you're going to want to do that. But here's a real-life example where factoring might be useful to you um, outside of the classroom. Suppose a penny is thrown straight down from a height of 200 feet. At the same time, a paintbrush is dropped from a height of 100 feet. The polynomials represent the height in feet of the objects after t seconds. So <clears throat> you'll notice that we have two different polynomials here. It says that t represents seconds and the polynomials or the entire function represents the height in feet. So let's say t is the time since the object was released. And we're going to say f of t and g of t are the object's height and feet. And then we're going to assign each of these polynomials to be a function. So here's a quadratic trinomial representing the higher object. Here is a quadratic binomial representing the lower object. Now I want you to take just a second, I want you to take a look at these two polynomials or these two polynomial functions, and I want you to tell me if there's anything that you notice just off the top of your head about them. Um, I guess I've already underlined one of those. Did you notice that they both start with a negative 16t squared? You're going to see that quadratic term show up quite a bit because that is a gravitational constant. In other words, any object that is um, falling towards the Earth under its own weight and under the influence of gravity and nothing else always approaches the Earth at negative 16 feet per second squared. Um, if you've come from a science class, you may have also seen this described in meters. It's negative 9.8 meters per second squared or meters per second squared times time squared. But the point for us here in this class is just to recognize that anytime we have a gravitational pull on an object, it's always going to be negative 16 t squared. The second thing I want to make sure I draw your attention to is this 200 and this 100. If you look at the original problem, a penny is thrown straight down from a height of 200 feet. That corresponds to this 200 right here. In other words, if I were to stick in zero seconds, this term would become a zero, this term would become a zero, and I have an initial height of 200 feet. The same thing over here, it says at the same time a paintbrush is dropped from a height of 100 feet. If I stick in zero seconds, this plus 100 on the end is going to represent the height at the start of the problem. That's the initial height. And then lastly, you've got this negative 40t, uh, this negative 40t in here. Um, that's kind of interesting because... Um, it kind of adjusts the the peak of of our, our of our parabola, and I'll show you the graph of that here in just a second. Um, but by and large, it has to do with initial velocity. In other words, um, when we begin the problem, this paintbrush is just dropped from 100 feet, but this negative 40t suggests that this penny was not just dropped, but rather it was it was thrown. It had some kind of initial velocity attached to it so that it, it falls faster than it would normally if we had just let it go. Um, just something to keep in mind, not terribly relevant to us in, in, in a math setting, but certainly in a science setting it is very important and it does help us understand where these polynomials come from. <clears throat> so let's answer a couple questions. First of all, how high are the objects after 1.5 seconds. 
notice that 1.5 seconds is a time. It is a value for t. So if I wanted to find the height of the object after 1.5 seconds, I would just take my two functions and I would plug in a 1.5 for the time. And then I would just use my calculator to calculate this out. If you've got a scientific calculator, it's probably going to handle the order of operations for you. If it doesn't, you're going to want to be very careful with those. Either way, when you put a 1.5 in for t and you compute that out, it comes out to 104 feet. If I plug in the 1.5 in the second equation, it comes out around 64 feet. <clears throat> now, I did go ahead and take the Desmos app, and I plugged both of these functions into Desmos to see what they look like. This red upside-down parabola represents the, um, the first function, the, the function for the penny. You'll notice that it has an initial height of 200. You'll see that right here it crosses at 200. Um, notice that it does look like it's already been traveling down before it reaches that point. That's that initial velocity taking place. It's, it's saying, hey, we're not actually at what would have been the peak if gravity was acting alone. Um, some kind of a force is also acted on this. So we're at 200, and you can see it's falling towards the ground, getting closer and closer to the ground as time passes. The other function, plus 100, you can see we're starting here at 100, and we're coming down to the right as time passes. Now, in reality, um, this left side of the graph, everything before zero, is what's happening prior to the, um, the object being dropped. And so we would just ignore that, knowing that our model only represents time starting from the initial drop on. The second thing you might be asked is, when will the objects hit the ground? When will the objects hit the ground? And there should be a question mark there that I need to go back and add. Um, well, when the object hits the ground, we're talking about its height. How high above the ground is the ground? Well, it's zero feet above the ground. So I'm going to take both of these functions. I'm going to put a zero in for the height, or the f of t and the g of t. Very important that you realize, first of all, that when it hits the ground, it's zero feet high. Second, it's important that you realize that that zero is the height not the time. You now have two equations. Two equations. These are both in standard form, meaning they are in descending order by exponent. They cannot be solved in this form. Instead, we need to factor these equations. So let's start with this one on the left. Whenever I factor, I always look for the GCF first. This one does indeed have a GCF. Um, if you think you can factor and solve this without my help, I'd suggest you pause the video and try to do it on your own. Otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and keep going. This has a GCF of negative 8. Notice when I pull out the negative 8, the leading coefficient becomes a positive 2. That's why I pulled out a negative 8 instead of a positive 8, is I wanted that leading coefficient to be positive. Negative 40 became positive 5, plus 200 became minus 25. Notice this is still a quadratic trinomial. Once I've taken out the GCF, I look for difference of squares. That only works in binomials, so that's no good. I then look for trinomial squares patterns. This is not a perfect square, so that's not going to work. So what I've got to do then is I've got to resort to my guess and check. Again, I would suggest pausing the video and trying that on your own. I'm going to pretend you've already done that, and I'm going to keep moving. When I factor, this factors into 2t minus 5 and t plus 5. If you struggled with that, that is not the topic we're covering here today. You're going to want to go back and watch um, our video on factoring ax squared plus bx plus c. Once you've got it into this form, you have negative 8 times the quantity 2t minus 5 times the quantity t plus 5. Notice that those three things multiply together to give us a 0. The zero product property says if things multiply together and equals a zero, at least one of them must be a zero. So I'm going to take each of these factors and set them equal to zero. Either zero is equal to negative eight. Well, that doesn't make any sense. 2t minus 5 equals zero. I have to solve that, and I would show my work if I had more room. I will assume you're going to show your work, and I get time equals 2.5, or t plus 5 equals zero which means t equals negative 5. 
but that means that it hit the ground before we dropped it. That doesn't make any sense. If I come over here and look at the graph, you can actually see that it does cross, the, the, the red line does cross at 0, 2.5. It comes up, reaches its peak here, and it does also touch at 0, negative 5. This is a solution to the equation, but it does not make sense in our story because we can only have positive times here. Let's look at the other, um, the other object, the paintbrush. Again, I'm going to suggest that you pause this and factor this on your own. I'm going to pretend you've already done that, and I'm going to keep going. I factor out my negative 4. I then look for the difference of squares pattern. This actually is a difference of squares pattern. You see perfect square minus perfect square. That's going to factor nicely, and you get this. You have three terms or three factors that multiply together to give you zero. That means at least one of them is zero. Either zero equals negative four. That doesn't make any sense. 2t plus 5 equals zero. You would work that out and get negative 2.5. Or 2t minus 5 equals zero, which is 2.5. Notice I crossed out the negative 2.5 because that doesn't make sense in our story. Notice, by the way, both objects hit the ground in 2.5 seconds. Um, so we, we know that gravity affects all objects the same way. So in order for the coin to hit the ground at the same time, it must have been moving faster than the paintbrush at the beginning. Therefore, it must have been thrown. Does that all make sense? That's a lot of information at once. You may need to pause and go back and watch some of that again. Um, I, th I think if you see it a couple times, though, it will make some sense for you. Let's do a couple more problems real quick. Um, a, a bird picks up a golf ball and drops it while flying. The function represents the height, y, and feet of the golf ball t seconds after being dropped. Notice you've got y and you have t. The ball hits the top of a 32-foot tall pine tree. After how many seconds does the ball hit the tree? Notice what it says. After how many seconds? In this problem, we're looking for the time. Also notice that they give us the function over here. I've noticed that a lot of years my students struggle with that question because they don't bother to look at the picture and get all the information. But they did give us a function. So I'm going to copy that function. Remember, y is height, t is time. The ball is hitting the top of a 32-foot tall tree. So the question is, how much time until it reaches a height of 32 feet. Once you've plugged in the right value in the right position, it's just a matter of solving the equation. Remember, when you solve these quadratics, you've got to subtract that 32 from both sides so that one side is equal to zero. Then you're going to factor the other side. This does not have a GCF, but it is a difference of squares pattern. Therefore, it's going to factor very nicely. Once I have that, the zero product property says either the 7 minus 4t must be a zero or the 7 plus 4t must be a zero. We need to solve both of those. Again, that is not the focus here today. And if I had more time and room, I would work that out. But at this point in our course, you ought to be good at solving a single variable equation. This comes out as 7 fourths or 1 and 3 fourths. This is negative 7 fourths or negative 1 and 3 fourths. That makes no sense because the ball can't hit the ground before the bird let go. Getting easier, right? Here's one more. By the way, that means the answer is 1 and 3 fourths seconds. You can model the arch of a fireplace using the equation y equals negative 1 ninth x plus 18 x minus 18, where x and y are measured in inches. The axis represents the floor, or the x-axis represents the floor, so the x-axis is 0. Find the width of the arch at floor level. The width of the arch at floor level. Now this is nice because this is already in factored form for you. The only thing you need to realize is that at the floor, your y value is going to be 0. So you take your function. Notice that we're looking for those two points right there. So we're going to take this function and we're going to set it equal to zero because those are zero uh, inches high because they're on the floor. We're going to set each of the factors equal to zero. Zero equals negative one ninth makes no sense. X plus 18 equals zero should give you negative 18. We're going to hold that for just a second. 
and x plus 18 equals 0 is going to give you positive 18. Notice this is the point 18, 0. This is the point negative 18, 0. So how wide is it? Well, from the center to one point, we said that was over 18. From the center to the other point is also 18. It's 18 in a negative direction, but we're concerned about distance, so we're not concerned about positives and negatives. Altogether, that is 36 inches wide. Hopefully this has been useful and of value to you. Um, I think you'll see that once you learn how to read the problem, you can get the, the values plugged in the right spot. It's really just like all the other problems we've done in the unit where you just simply factor and then solve. Um, if this has been useful to you, make sure you leave us a like. Make sure you leave us a comment in the comment section if that option is still available. And then make sure that you um, ring that bell, turn on your notifications so that you can receive all the cool new stuff coming out of Nunley Math. Uh, I wish you all the very, very best. You all take care of yourselves, all right? Bye-bye.